Okay, so it's been a while. The last time, Thursday night last week, we were, well, you guys looked at 1 Corinthians 6 and uh, talking about taking others to court. And Christians taking Christians to court. How uh, how wrong that was. Um, how wrong it is for us to do that. To to have a, a worldly take on each other. Sometimes the church can be guilty of that, of acting like the world and doing things just like the world. And the church at Corinth, if anything. Well, it shows us how the church can become a lot like the world and look and act a lot like the world. The world creeps in. Worldly teachings, worldly things creep in. Um, and the church at Corinth was full of all kinds of problems. We talked about their sexual immorality. That comes up a little bit tonight with uh, how prevalent it was in, the, in Corinth. How prevalent it is in our in California. <laughs> over and over, I remind myself that this could just as well be called First Californians as it is First Corinthians. We're not so familiar with how Corinth did things, but it's a lot like our our state of California in just their uh, carnal ways. How uh, the uh, popularity of, of man's ideas. Um, we talked a lot about that earlier in Corinthians. The wisdom of the world was there. That was the center of it. Um, they had all kinds of brilliant thinkers, brilliant uh, people that wrote, wrote many books, theologians and uh, philosophers there in that region. And Paul touched on it and called it all foolishness. The foolishness of the world. Uh, and we're guilty of turning to those things sometimes as well. But we all have questions about marriage. We all probably have questions about divorce. And 1 Corinthians 7 will address those two things. It's a heavy chapter. Uh, it's... it's um, Paul responding to a letter that they had written. So verse 1 lets us in on that, and there's kind of a switch of gears, um, and the, the title of the message is a hint at now concerning. We're going to see that over and over, even all the way into chapters 12, 13, 14, uh, now concerning these issues that they had written to him about. And this is touching on the first of those issues. So, now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. End of Bible study. We can all wrap up and go home, right? <laughs> it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Uh, this would have been one of the questions they had asked. And what it means, it doesn't mean like cooties, even touching a man or touching a woman, but rather the sexual touching, the uh, intimate touching, and going even further to say, another translation puts it, it is good for a man not to marry, to, to remain single. Um, and so, uh, you can see why verse 2 is written the way it is. So, uh, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, verse 2, nevertheless, to avoid fornication or sexual immorality, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband and likewise also the husband hath no power over his own body, but the wife. And defraud ye not one another, uh, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fastings and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not 
for your incontinency. So, um, he's talking about sexual Im intimacy between a man and a wife, and a wife and her husband. Um, and he says the only time to really <laughs> take, a, take a break from that sexual intimacy with one another is when it's consensual. That is, both the husband and the wife agree together, let's take some time, not have sex, not be intimate with one another, and be in prayer and in fasting. Um, sadly, uh, the Christian marriage, the Christian relationship, oftentimes sex is not spoken of quite often as freely as it should be. God created it. God is, is not kept outside of the bedroom when sex happens between a man and a woman. In fact, it's quite the opposite. God is right there in the midst. It's a beautiful thing. However, just like a fire, you know, I can show you how beautiful a fire is as long as it's in the fireplace or the fire pit. As soon as you take that fire and bring it in the anywhere that it's not supposed to be contained, it's a mess and it's destructive. That's just like sex within the confines of marriage. It's destructive, it becomes a real mess, and it destroys all kinds of things around it if it's taken out of the wedding, the marriage relationship. And so, um, what yeah, the, the Word of God is always politically incorrect. In verse 4, the, the feminists hate reading that, especially because it first says the wife has no power over her own body, flying totally in the face of all women, especially in our culture, in our day and age. But they don't keep reading. They will take the verse and act like it's, it's uh, mean and that it just hates women and that it's, it's uh, misogynistic. It's, you know, these, these uh, men and their terrible ideas and barbaric ways. Well, the husband has no power over his own body. You belong for your wife. That's the reason for your body. It's to be given to your wife. See, the, the whole idea of marriage, the reason I know it's from God, that God came up with this concept, is it's giving to one another, not just taking. And in fact, where you get in trouble in a marriage is when you expect and just say, please me, please me, you're only here to please me. It's all about me. Kind of an attitude. Your marriage will be ruined if that's the attitude that I have. Is that if, if that's the way I go about it. I need to take verse 4 and underline my part. The husband has no power over his own body, but it's the wife. And it talks about, in verse 5, defraud not one another. The idea is deprive not one another, or even do not cheat one another out of, you know, what is there for the marriage relationship. Whether it's procreation, God has given me a wife and I have been given to her to meet her needs. And she's not put here to meet my needs. And I just demand this and that from her. No. I need to focus on me meeting her need. <laughs> not... Now, I should say, I need to focus on her and how I can meet her needs instead of just focusing on me, 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 how I can be fulfilled. So, this whole idea of marriage and the sexual intimacy between uh, 
the husband and wife, is such a big subject. It's such a, a big thing. And in, in, uh, Paul, you'll see, has a hard time um, touching on it. <laughs> in fact, verse 6, he's going to do this quite a bit in this chapter. Verse 6, I speak this by permission and not of commandment. In other words, what I'm about to say is not a command. It's just a suggestion. It's just a permission, a permit, uh, something I'm permitted to say. Verse 7, I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man has his own proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Now, it doesn't mean to burn in hell. <laughs> but it is better to marry than to just burn with lust and always craving and desiring sex and pleasure. Always thinking and just dwelling on those kinds of things. We don't need any help. It's in every music video. It's in every song that we hear that comes on. We already dwell on this far, far too much. Too many married people think like they're single. And too many single people think like they should be married. And all they're thinking about is, one day I need to get married. And Paul's point in this section will be be what you've been called to be. And for Paul, in that case, he was single at this time. Now, it would seem that Paul at one point was married. And that could be that his wife died and he later, you know, was converted on the road to Damascus. But there's another possibility that his wife would have thought he was a madman when he did get converted on the road to uh, Damascus and Jesus met Paul right where he was at and totally changed Saul to Paul, which was a radical transformation for anyone to take in, but it, especially his wife, who would have known him best, it's very possible that she just said, you lost your mind and left him for that. Either way, Paul was most likely married because he was a part of the Sanhedrin. It was a requirement for the Sanhedrin. Um, but uh, Paul acknowledges in verse uh, 7 that it is a gift that he's single at this time. I would that all men were even as I am, but every man has his proper what? Gift of God. So it's not for everyone to be single. He's, he's uh, commending you if you do remain single. He's going to bring that up again. Um, well, let's keep reading. Verse 10. And unto the married I command ye not I, but the Lord. I command you, not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. This is now from the Lord unto your mar you married people. And if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife or divorce his wife. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife that uh, believes not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which has an husband that believes not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether yet you shall save your husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether you shall save your wife? 
But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. So verse, uh, all the way down there through 17, like we just read, what Paul is bringing out is this idea um, of man and its divorce. Uh, the whole thing was brought about because of the hardness of man's heart. Uh, Matthew chapter 19, you could jot that down. Jesus taught on this very issue in Matthew 19, uh, Matthew 19 verses 1 through 12. But I like, we'll just read a couple verses from uh, Matthew 19. Um, Jesus just got done saying, In the beginning, God created a man, male and female, and he said, Let, uh, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh, wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man tear apart. And I think it's important for us <clears throat> to even stop there and, and consider what Jesus just said. Because there's many, many excuses, there's many, many relationships and marriages that have gone completely against that and man has torn them apart. What God brought together this man and this woman, whether it was 30 years ago, 50 years ago, now they're not married anymore. Now things have been ripped apart. And Jesus is saying to the, uh, the Pharisees and the religious guys here in Matthew 19, it ought not to be. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. No one tear them apart. That's God's design. And of course, these Pharisees in verse 7 of Matthew 19 come and say, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Now they twist even Moses' words. They say that Moses commanded that we divorce our wife. That didn't happen. <laughs> Rather, Moses, Jesus says in verse 8 of Matthew 19, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you or permitted that you would divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that God had a design, God has a way, <laughs> that from the beginning, this is how it should be. One man... One woman till death do you part. And too many uh, people get involved. And even then, the Jewish uh, rabbis had these teachings that uh, you could only, you know, they had the two extremes. And really, Jesus goes on in Matthew 19 to clarify that the one side is the right side. That unless a man is cheating, on his wife, having sex with another woman, there's no reason to divorce. And vice versa. If, if the uh, woman is cheating on the man with another guy, then there's no reason for, for divorce unless there be this unfaithfulness or cheating. Um, that was one side. But the rabbis had another side uh, that was completely just ridiculous to where they said that if your wife put too much salt on your eggs it was considered unclean and you could divorce her for that if if your wife was out talking to another gentleman or even another person that you didn't agree with you could put your wife away or divorce her for that so even in that time the rabbis took these, these uh, teachings of divorce 
and it was really man's traditions, the rabbi's teachings on what divorce, uh, what what could uh, be seen right in the eyes of God when it came to divorce. And like I said, the only reason would be unfaithfulness. Um, the only legit reason. Uh, and also Malachi 2.15 is very clear. God's thoughts on divorce. Malachi 2.15 Did not He make one? Yet had He not the residue of the Spirit and wherefore one that He might seek a, good, a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, hates divorce. Malachi 2.16 God never intended. That's the idea there. It's never the route to go. Divorce. It shouldn't be on any Christian's mind or on their in their vocabulary for that matter. It is just not an option. If you got married and you were Christians, there's just no getting around that. So Paul's uh, ability to stay single was a gift. Um, we just looked at what the Lord thinks of divorce. Um, one of the biggest reasons for God's hatred of divorce and his even even bringing up all this is that divorce will inflict wounds that never heal. Divorce inflicts wounds that never heal. They just don't. God is able to do anything. But the ugliness of divorce, and what, what's being spoken of, is even if you're married and you find yourself in this position of being married to somebody who's not a believer, what we just got done reading is that the, wife, the husband is sanctified, not saved, but rather set apart to where there's still an opportunity for the husband that's not a believer to turn at some point and to begin to believe. And he says, who knows, wife, like we read you know, you could be involved in saving your husband. Or vice versa. Who knows, husband? You could be involved in saving your wife. Now, we should clarify that only God can save. It doesn't matter how much we might want to turn our kids or turn our wife or whoever it is, turn them over and, uh, you know, shake them out of hell into heaven, God alone saves. But there is this hope for restoration. This hope for sanctification and ultimately for salvation to be saved. Um, so we remember only God can save. But it's interesting the end of verse 14 were your children unclean now they are holy. You know, if you're if uh, you have two parents that don't believe in God, you're going to definitely have children that go the wrong way. <laughs> At least if there's one believer in the house, your children will most likely get saved. Um, are children saved? Where where do babies go when they die? I've always loved this, especially because. Just yesterday we celebrated our little Adam, our stillborn baby. We never got to bring into the world, but he's in heaven. How do I know he's in heaven? Second Samuel 12, verse 18 is pretty precious. When you look at Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, you have this story of King David. Remember, he saw a woman. <laughs> And they had sexual relations. Well, she got pregnant and he had her husband killed. King David was not the cleanest king. He had his issues, his problems. But after having that done, God saw this baby and uh, basically 
Nathan came along and warned David, and the baby got very, very sick. And David was on his face before the Lord. And in 2 Samuel 12, verse 18, you, you learn that the baby dies. And then David does something interesting in 2 Samuel 12. This is at verse 22. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and I wept, I mourned, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child might live? But now that the baby is dead, wherefore should I fast? Why should I keep crying about it, is the idea. Can I bring him back again to earth? This is 2 Samuel 12, 23. I will go to him but he shall not return to me. And what a precious promise by God that I will go to my baby one day in heaven. The one that wasn't able to, well, didn't have to suffer here on this earth the way that we do. Amen? And what a, what a uh, radical thing that our children can be saved as long as we're you know, before they hit a certain age. Now, for for girls, I think the age is something like five years old. But for boys, it's got to be something like 18. <laughs> Just kidding. But it's whenever you mature to the point where you now are accountable. You are. It's between you and the Lord. Your relationship with God has nothing to do with your mom, has nothing to do with your dad, your brothers, your sister. It's all between you and the Lord. And for every one of us, we had to come to that point. But for little babies, there's this uh, time when, when they would die and they go uh, to be with the Lord, really. Um, and it's, it's kind of the same idea. However, we know that an unbelieving husband is not saved because his wife is saved. <laughs> and this, this vice versa, where the unbelieving wife is saved because the husband is saved. No. <laughs> we all come to that point where it's between me and the Lord. It's between you and the Lord. So, um, also it should be noted that God uh, ordained and established the home and the family long, long before He ordained and established the church. I think that should be duly noted when talking about marriage, when talking about these things. And one of the reasons in the church at Corinth you had uh, wives being married to unbelievers is exactly that. There was a family before the church was birthed. And it's the same way today. God has this church here, but long, long before this church ever came along, or the church was ever established, family and the, the family unit has existed. God established that long, long before. And so I think it's important to, to acknowledge that. You're, you're going to have problems in the family. Uh, but, is any man called, verse 18 goes on, is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So if you're called and you've, you were in slavery or you were a servant, and God called you, praise the Lord you're free. If you were called and saved and you were already free, praise the Lord, now you're a servant of Christ. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. 
Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Somebody put it best, I think, when they said, you want to bloom where you have been planted. You want to just thrive wherever the Lord has placed you. Don't be dreaming of this and dreaming of that. Rather, just be content with where the Lord has called you, who the Lord has called you to, and just thrive and bloom right where you've been planted, wherever you were called from, whatever area you've been called from. You just thrive in that very environment. Uh, one thing that's interesting about verse 19, 18 and 19, is if you're circumcised, let him not become uncircumcised. That is, if God called you and you were from this Jewish heritage and having you know the commandments of God entrusted to you, however, if any of you were called an uncircumcised, let him not be circumcised. There's a movement, there's actually always been a movement of Hebrew uh, fanatics that think that Christians need to take on everything that the Jews ever did. And Paul is pretty clear right here. If you were called as a Gentile, uncircumcised, remember that was like a cuss word to King David as a little boy, you uncircumcised Philistine, he called Goliath. And so you and I are Gentiles. Nothing to do with Jews. Nothing to do with their, their, uh, what God has entrusted and, and called them to do. Don't start keeping the Sabbath days. Don't start keeping all the feast days. Don't fall into that trap. I, I thought that was interesting. That that's pretty clear there. Um, so, let every man just be where God has called him to be. And now concerning virgins, verse 25, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. <laughs> I say that it is good for a man so to be. For someone to be a virgin is an honorable thing, a good thing. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. If you're already married, don't seek to be free. <laughs> Are you loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. He's speaking to the young men. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a, vir if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. <laughs> but this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, they, uh, that both they that have wives be as, those that, as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possessed not. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. But I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried, uh, care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin, the unmarried woman, cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you or you know, put a trip on you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. But if any man think, that he behaves himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the, the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will. 
He sins not. Let them marry. Nevertheless, he that stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but have power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doth well. So then, he that gives her in marriage does well, but he that gives not, gives her not in marriage, does better. <laughs> this is, again, Paul's, uh, he's going to clarify, this is just Paul's words. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married, to whom she will, only in the Lord, but she is happier if she so abide, after my judgment, my opinion. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. <laughs> so it's, it's, the clarity is made, Paul's being clear that I have an opinion about this. For virgins, it's good for you to remain a virgin. And he said earlier, it's better, uh, it, it would, it's better to get married than to just burn with passion. Um, and it has to be something the Lord has gifted you with to remain a virgin. And He, t he gives the reasons why. Um, and I think one thing that's kind of neat about 1 Corinthians 7 is we learn that it's okay for us as Christians to have opinions. It's okay for me to have an opinion about some issue, something. Paul did. And it wasn't like he was dogmatic and said, this is the opinion to have. You know, He left it open for one who has the ability to go ahead and get married. That's great. <laughs> and then he throws in his, but it's better if you remain a virgin. <laughs> And that's just kind of the way Paul was. And he explained, if you're not married, you don't have to think about how to please your husband. Or for the husband, you don't have to think how you're going to please your wife. And so Paul's point in this is not everyone has to get married. In fact, 1 Timothy 4.3 in 1 Timothy 4.3, I think it's worth noting one of the signs of apostates, that is false teachers, cults that come in. In 1 Timothy 4.3, they forbid to marry and command to abstain from eating meats and different dietary things. Uh, Paul would write to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.3 to beware of these weirdos that come in and say, now you have to stay a virgin. They're called nuns today. They're called all kinds of groups, cults, that will come in and not just teach, like Paul was saying, it's good if you're able to do it. But it's not something you need to lay down the law and say, no, you need to remain a virgin and never get married. And if you're ever thinking that, it's evil thoughts. And if all, if all we had was 1 Corinthians 7 for Paul's views on marriage, it would be really confusing. Really hard. Thank God we have Ephesians 5, which clarifies, as Christ loves the church, husbands are to love their wives and give themselves for her. So you have a picture of godly marriage in Ephesians 5. Um, and of course Genesis, Genesis 2.18 makes it abundantly clear. I don't know how Paul eventually came to grips with Genesis 2.18 that says it's not good for a man to be alone. <laughs> Paul would say it's good for a man not to touch a woman. But somebody, well, rightfully what we need to remember is how perverted and twisted the time was. See, 
the problems for the church at Corinth were vastly different from the problems for the church at, say, Philippi or the church at Thessalonica. These problems and issues were very uh, detailed toward Corinth. See, in Corinth, for one thing, it was very normal to have more than one wife in Corinth during this time. It was actually considered weak, and uh, you were you were uh, put out like uh, ostracized if you were a virgin, and they you know found out about you being a virgin. You were totally ostracized. It was a weird thing. Greeks, uh, the Greek culture in this area of Corinth, just that's what they pr prided themselves on how free they were. I mean, people just walked around naked. They didn't think anything of it. They thought it was art. And you had sexual perversions. You had things going on there that were just sick and, and uh, perverted, twisted. And so Paul comes along and writes the, this letter. Some of it sounds strange as we're reading it, but it's very clear. And what Paul is making clear is that marriage is to be honorable between one woman and one man. Uh, and it's honorable if you save yourself and you're a virgin until that day. And if you don't have the desire to get married, that's another honorable thing in Paul's sight. We're not to be legalistic about it and say that this is the way that you have to go. Um, another thing that, that uh, we need to remember is that you would be putting your life in jeopardy if you lived for Christ in that area of Corinth. Um, and he makes mention to that, this present distress earlier in, in uh, I forget what verse that was, but, uh, and he talks about how the time is short. We don't, we're not promised a lot of time. Uh, verse 26, 1 Corinthians seven twenty-six. I suppose therefore that it, this is good for the present distress. So they were under distress, under persecution as believers. Um, and it would have been a hard, you know, harder life to go to, a life of singleness and being a virgin with all of this going on, this present distress, jeopardy all around them, a life of hardship. Um, And again, we have one life. It will soon pass. It's what we do for Christ that lasts. And Paul did a lot. Paul planted these churches, and if he had been married, most likely he would not have accomplished as much as he did. And so you see why the Lord used him, and still uses Paul, to encourage some people to remain single. Um, but for us as just believers that really believe in what the word of God says we cannot say one side is better than the other <laughs> and that's where we get in trouble if we begin to lay trips on people and say uh, you have to do it this way or you don't have to do it that way or you know, thinking we know what's best. No. The Lord is the one who wants to come along and do things in our lives. And He does incredible work through married couples. God is seen, I think, just as clear through two that become one, if not even clearer. It's, it's awesome how the Lord uses marriage. It's awesome how the Lord uses singleness. How the Lord 
uses us in all those different ways. So praise God for His Word. <laughs> Thank You, Lord, for Your Word this evening. I pray You just speak to our hearts. Lord, as we sing these last couple of songs, Lord, be pleased with us and be speaking to us. Lord, let Your Spirit just uh, fall afresh on us this evening. <laughs>